If you look in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, what's happening here is we have the servant Elisha, who was the protege of Elijah. And Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha, and Elisha became the next prophet of Israel. And Elisha was so amazing, and the gift and prophetic discernment on his life was so incredible that, of course, he was a prophet to Israel, so they were at war with the Syrians. And when Syria would come down for a battle, when they got there, Elisha had already told the armies of Israel what was going to happen and where to be or where not to be. And so the Syrians were so upset when they got back to their kingdom, the the king looked at his people and he said, Who among you is for the Israelites? Is there like a spy among us? And uh, somebody spoke up and said, No, king, there's no spy among us, but they have a prophet. And that prophet knows when we come and when we go and everything that's going on. So the king said, Okay, what I want you to do then is go down and arrest this guy. So they sent the armies, the Syrian armies, down to arrest Elisha. And this is where we pick up the story. The Syrian armies encamp all about Elisha's house. And Elisha and his servant are there. And Elisha's servant looks out. The Bible says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? It's over. We're surrounded here. This is it. And you know, I'm going to finish off this sermon series on the power of giving. And I'm not going to talk a lot about money today. But I'm going to get to the heart of the matter when we talk about money. And for the rest of our Christian walk, you know, the key ingredient to it all is faith. That's the key ingredient. When it really boils down to it, the way we live our life, the way we pray, the way we, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we believe God for the future, the way we handle money, it all boils down to faith. We are either people of faith or we're not people of faith. That's just, that's just the bottom line. We're either people of faith or we're not people of faith. So I'm going to give you three things to, to elevate the faith in your life and to cast out fear, which is the enemy of faith. Because how many know we have a lot to fear right now, if we would so choose to? I woke up, I think it was yesterday morning or the morning before, and I don't do this normally, but I grabbed my phone and I looked at the news stories for the day. And the first news story was a new COVID variant called Omicron that's coming out of South Africa that's appeared in Europe and they might be shutting back down Europe and America's under threat to being shut back down. Then the next story was of the Russians pushing in on Ukraine, testing President Biden to see what he'll do about it, kind of saber rattling. And I thought, okay, I'll stop right there. (laughs) Those are two things that could wreck my life if I allowed them to and wreck my week or my day if I allowed them to. We have plenty of opportunity to be fearful. But I'm going to give you three things that I believe will help you here. Number one, you need to get the right perspective. You need to get the right perspective. This is what's happening in the story of Elisha and his servant. Elisha's servant looks out with a perspective, a natural perspective, which produces fear. A natural perspective which produces fear. Oh no! The armies are all around us. There's no way out. There's just two of us, Elisha. What are we going to do? And then the next verse, the Bible says, So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Change your perspective. And Elisha then prayed. And here was his prayer. Lord, change his perspective. No, it's not really what he said, but it's in essence. Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Give him the right vision. Give him the right perspective. And then the Bible says, The Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. In one instance, God showed that boy the angel armies. And all the heavenly host around. Oh, hallelujah. How many knows God has surrounded His people with angels? 
How many knows that angels come as the ministers of, of God? They come to ser serve the people of God. They're all through Scripture. And if we could peel back curtain number two today and look back into the spirit realm, I think we would all be amazed to see from a heavenly perspective that God has more working for us than are those who are working against. Amen. Come on, somebody. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let, let, let me give you something along these lines that I think is going to help you. And turn with me to the book of Ephesians. I'm just building faith on top of breakthrough, all right? Ephesians chapter 1, Paul also prays, kind of like Elisha, Paul is praying for people, and here's what he prays, Ephesians 1 verse 17. And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray God opens your understanding, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe paul is praying for the christians that they would get understand his calling understand his inheritance and understand his power you know at, at, at least at this point he wasn't praying god help them out there lord jesus they're under persecution in ephesus and they're a minority there god among the pagan religions and God, she just give him some help, Lord. He wasn't praying that. He came on. He came from another perspective. Paul said, "God, I just pray you let them see who they really are. Let them see who they really are in you." And notice, notice the next thing. According to His power, verse nineteen, to the working of His mighty power which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. So He's saying, Lord, I pray that they understand the greatness of what You did in Christ through them, and now You've raised Christ up above all of this stuff, above every government authority, above every king, prince, Prime Minister and President, above every demonic spirit and principality, even above Satan himself. Christ is now seated above them all. And now let me show you something. Look over to the next chapter in chapter 2. And Paul has these great words in verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He has loved us, he, we are saved by grace, not by works. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together by Christ, you've been, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together. And raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he's saying not only is Christ, has Christ been raised above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, but you in Christ have now been raised up above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. He said, no, I'm sitting right here in Elizabeth City today. I'm not with him. I'm right here. Yes, you are physically, but positionally spiritually, and in terms of authority, you've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So why am I reading all this? Because to get the right perspective, you need to realize that you're living here on earth, but that's not your perspective. You've been seated in the heavenly places in Christ, and that is your new perspective. That now we're going into the fight already knowing that we win on the other side. We're walking into the battle already knowing that we have the victory over it in Jesus' name. We encounter sickness already knowing that by His stripes I am healed. Hallelujah. We encounter discouragement already knowing that Jesus said, In this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. We're walking into the things and the fight has already been fixed. The victory is already ours. We're not looking up on our problems. We're looking down on our problems. Come on, somebody put your hands together and give the Lord a shout. Look at your neighbor and say, get the right perspective. Second thing that's going to help you overcome fear and elevate your faith is stop blaming God for all your problems. 
Stop blaming God because I tell you, when we start looking at life like that, that everything that happens is the sovereignty of God. And I do believe in the sovereignty of God, but I think there are, there are, there are issues in Scripture. There are contingencies in the earth realm that God has placed that we need to understand. There's free will of man, and there's a lot of things happening here, okay? Because if everything happens is God's will, then we got to take that every disaster and every flood and every COVID variant and every cancer patient. I don't believe all of that is God's will. It happens under His created order that is fallen, but God has come from heaven and connected with us to bring us hope and salvation and deliverance in the midst of a fallen generation. So if we always blame God for everything bad that happens, it it deactivates our faith to believe Him for anything good. It, well, if, if this is just the will of God that I'm broke and in poverty, then it must be God's will. Then you start getting this attitude. God, why would you do this? Why did you allow this to happen? I don't believe that's the issue at all. Maybe in our prayers, maybe we act, ask with the wrong motive. James chapter 4. Maybe the timing isn't right yet, and the manifestation of our answer hasn't come yet, Luke chapter 11. Or maybe we prayed contrary to the will of God, and we're believing God for things that wasn't according to His will or His plan, Acts chapter 21. Or maybe we need to just grow up and realize that God doesn't serve us, we serve God. That He isn't a heavenly slot machine, but we're in a loving relationship with Him. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let me give you two examples from Scripture, I think, that really emphasize this. Number one, Mark chapter 9. Jesus comes off the Mount of Transfiguration. He's been up there transformed with Peter, James, and John. He comes down into the valley, and the rest of the disciples are here trying to cast out a demon from a boy, and they can't do it. The demon is too powerful for them. And so Jesus comes down the mountain, and the first thing he does is he rebukes the disciples because they're off in a corner over here talking to the scribes. And he walks up and he says, what are you talking to these guys for? And I don't know exactly what's going on, but I do know that the scribes did not believe in resurrection, and so I'm going to make an assumption. And that is that the scribes also didn't believe in miracles. And if they didn't believe in miracles then Jesus is coming and correcting the disciples, basically saying, if you're trying to work a miracle, why are you over here wasting time arguing with people who don't believe in miracles? That's my question for us today. Why, if we're believing God for signs and wonders, do we sit sit and listen to someone who doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, doesn't believe in casting out demons, doesn't believe in laying hands on the sick, believe it all passed away with the apostles? I want nothing of it. I'm sorry. I'm just being plain. It's all that turkey must have amped up my (laughs) tryptophan or something. It's like having a reaction. Get with, if you want miracles, get with some miracle working people. If you want faith, get with some faith believing people. If you want to see healing, get with some people that believe in laying hands on the sick. Hallelujah. If you want some Holy Ghost fire, get with some tongue talking, shouting, devil casting out Christians. Hallelujah. Jesus walks up to the man, the the boy's father that had the demon. And he said, what's going on? He says, it's terrible, man. The the demon cast my son into the fire. He has convulsions. It's, It's bad. And then notice this. He asked Jesus, he says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So he placed the burden over on Jesus. If you could do anything, would you please have compassion? And Jesus turns the table and says, if you can believe, if you can believe, anything's possible. And the man, the light bulb came on in this guy and he said, Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Help the part of me that's not believing for this miracle. And Jesus walks up and casts a demon out of this boy. Second instance. Mark chapter 1, a leper comes to Jesus. And the leper comes up to him in chapter 1, and the leper says this, it's interesting. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If it's in your sovereign control. 
If it's in the decrees of God. And Jesus looks at him and says, I am willing. Be thou cleansed. When I go to God for healing, I often think of that passage. Because the revealed will of God to me is healing. He said, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. By my stripes you are healed. By my stripes, first or Second Peter, you were healed. Matthew said that these scriptures were given in fulfillment of the healing ministry of Jesus when he saw the physical miracles. That was the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. Because some like to argue that Isaiah 53 is about the healing of Israel and all this, which I think it does have implications for that. But Mark Matthew directly related it to the healing ministry of Jesus. So when I think about that, I go back to that passage that he looked at the leper and said, I am willing, man. Stop blaming God. And start believing. In finances, stop blaming God and start, start doing what the book says. Work. I preached a prosperity message last week. Y'all need to go listen to it if you haven't heard it. I know y'all were waiting on that. I'm going to sow a thousand dollar seed and all my problems are going to be gone. Now God can do that, but that's not what I preached. I preached four Bible principles of prosperity. Number one, work. Number two, invest. Number three, live a holy life. Has direct implications to prosperity. And number four, then honor God with all of it. Give back to the Lord, honor God, and honor His Word. And I believe if we follow that, sow when God says sow, tithe, help mission, do all of that out of the overflow that God gives us, I believe that's the prosperity path. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. So stop blaming God, start doing what the book says, and then start believing Him for greater and greater and greater. Can somebody shout amen? amen. One more thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray after this. One more thing, you must develop a long-term outlook of faith. Because we often come into things and we have such a society that works on such instantaneous basis. You know, everything's instant. I mean, do you remember the days of dial-up internet service? Some of you kids don't even know what I'm talking about. But I had dial-up, you know, dial-up AOL. And I, this is no joke. I used to read books. I'd always have a book with me. As I was downloading pages, I would read chapters in books. And now, if we don't get it instantly, we're calling Bobby. What's wrong? Right? We want instant access. It's, it's, this is the age we live in. And so when it comes to our spirituality, I think some of that bleeds through. And if we pray a prayer and it isn't answered, we're like, oh, I give up, man. Forget this stuff. Or, or if we come to church for three months and, and everything isn't just perfect in our lives, then we're just going to give up and try something else. No, let, let me show you something. You don't come to Christ and add on your mess to Jesus or, no, or add Jesus onto your mess. you got to lay down everything. Take Him as your all. And then a divine exchange happens. When you turn it all over to Him, He comes and pours His righteousness into you and He puts something in your spirit that's going to last. And it's a long-term outlook of faith because faith has a sticky nature to it. When you believe and you have the faith of God, it sticks to promises through thick and thin. Faith has a perseverance to it. It doesn't give up when things go bad. It doesn't give up when storms and trials come. It keeps pushing. It keeps persevering. It keeps knocking. Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. In the original Greek, they were all a continual verbs. I'm going to ask and keep on asking. I'm going to seek and keep on seeking. I'm going to knock and keep on knocking. What if I don't get an answer? I'm going to keep on knocking. You prayed for your loved ones. God saved my whole family. Three months later, they're not saved. You going to give up? No, we're going to go back to knocking. I know people, there was a guy in my home church who was a preacher. His mom and dad were great saints of God. They prayed for years that this boy would get saved, and he never did. They died and went to heaven. 
after they were gone, he got saved, called to preach, and lived the rest of his life ministering the gospel. I'm telling you, some things we won't see until we get over yonder. Hallelujah. Because our prayers don't just go away. They stand as memorials before God. And God sees them before His presence always. Faith has a stubbornness to it. Faith won't take no for an answer. No, we believe in this thing. I thank God for my wife Jackie. That's what, that was her M.O. I mean, it's no, Hans, we're believing for this thing and that's it. When we came to find a place to live, I would do all the research and whatever needed to be done, but then, and we always came together on decisions, but I would defer to her because I knew I would settle for less than she would. <laughs> and to Jackie, it was a faith thing. It was a faith thing. And I thought, well, I'm just going to have to, I'm just going to go through this process until something rings her bell. And she says, this is it. We're not compromising for anything else. The house that I live in right now, we went to it and we saw it the first day. And we walked back out to the car and we sat in the car and Jackie said, I think I just found my home. I was like, <laughs> but thank God for someone who wouldn't settle for no or for less. We're all in. We're just all into this thing. Amen. We, if you're going to jump in the pool, we might as well jump in the deep end. Come on. We might, you better be all in or all out. Hallelujah. Lukewarm, you don't want to be. Get all in and believe for everything. Believe for everything the book says. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're given the great hall of faith, the great litany of faith believers in the past, right? And so he starts out and he talks about Noah. Okay, Noah was a great guy. Noah's a great guy of faith. But listen to Noah's life. Noah lived like, what, over 900 years. And, and Noah built an ark. And he built an ark for a flood that God told him was going to happen. But yet it had never rained in history. Okay, now, let, let me say this again. He was building an ark, a boat to float in floodwaters from rains that had never happened. And I got into this thing the other night, trying to figure out how long he actually worked on that ark. And I don't, I don't know the answer. If you do, you can tell me. But some speculate that he worked 120 years on it because it says that God had given him 120 years, mankind 120 years to turn it around and get right. For 120 years they didn't. So there's a speculation that Noah worked on the ark for 120 years. That's a man who had a long-term outlook of faith. That he went out and he began hammering. And people are walking by and they're saying, what is he building? What is he? Oh, it's an ark. Oh, okay, great. And he keeps, and he keeps year, decade goes by, 20 years go by, 30 years go by, 50 years go by, and he's still working on a word he received from the Lord. And he never quit. Persevering, persevering, persevering. Our faith doesn't quit. COVID can't knock us out. We keep believing. Communist governments has never been able to knock the church out. They just grow stronger persecution, believe it or not, the church, I've heard the church in Afghanistan and Iran's two of the fastest growing churches in the world and they've undergone tremendous persecution. I mean tremendous, but something happens like wildfire because God's people don't back down, man. They just keep believing and keep going and keep pushing on. So what happens eventually one day, the rain started to fall and the people started flipping out and they came, I just don't, I, this isn't in scripture, but I just can't help but believe they came knocking and bag, banging and cr crawling and scraping trying to get in that ark. But the Bible says that God put Noah and his family in and God shut the door. Because I think Noah would have had some compassion in his heart, but God said, it's over. I said it was over. Now this is not between you and them. It's between me and them now, and this is judgment. The day of mercy had ended. 
but Noah's faith persevered. Then he mentions Moses in Hebrews 11. Think about this. Moses, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the backside of the desert becoming a nobody, and then 40 years leading God's people through the wilderness, and he eventually gets to the point at Kadesh Barnea to where the 12 spies went into the promised land. Only two of them had faith that they could take it. The other 10 came back with a negative report, and God says, move out of the way. I'm going to destroy them all, Moses. This is ridiculous. But he intercedes for the people, and Moses hangs in there, and listen to this. Who would do this? Who in this room would do this? He went on for years with that rebellious crowd, knowing they would never make it to the promised land. He led a people that he knew would never attain the goal that they set out to attain. And then even Moses died looking into the promised land but couldn't walk into it. Come on, somebody say, my faith perseveres. Think about even Joseph. Joseph was, what, 17 when he received the dreams of his family and the stars and the sun and moon and all that bowing to him and the sheaves of the field bowing to him. And then it wasn't until he was 30 that he's brought out of the prison in Egypt and elevated to the height of the kingdom. So that's a good 13 years of being betrayed, being sold as a slave, then being betrayed again, being put into prison, and then being forgotten in prison, and then eventually having the promise come. I'm telling you, our faith doesn't quit. Our faith sticks to it. And I'm telling you, you hang on to Jesus, you're going to make it. Whatever comes, you're going to make it. It's going, you're going to work. It's going to work. Come on, we're going to make it. We're almost out of 2021, and I feel like shouting. Hallelujah. I was like shouting when I got out of 2020. I feel like shouting greater when I get out of 2021. Hallelujah. Why? Because I, but I thank God for what He's been doing in the midst. There's stuff happening around the globe. I'm able to preach on a monthly basis. Crusades all over the nation, seeing people radically saved, and I mean amazingly healed because God has done something even in the midst of what Satan has started, God is turning it around for his good and doing some amazing things. Maybe there's some people that we lost and it's terrible. It's heartbreaking. There's some people who left church and that's heartbreaking. But I'm telling you, those of you who've stuck in, we're coming out of this fire being tried. Hallelujah. We're coming out like gold. Hallelujah. We got a faith like we didn't have two years ago, brother. We got a stick to itiveness like we didn't have about five years ago. We've seen things now we've never seen before and God's saying you just hold on I'm going to show you my glory I'm going to peel back the heavens you're going to go to a level you've never been before don't quit now my brother get fear out of your life believe God for the best believe that he's going to do everything he said he's going to do come on somebody shout hallelujah Come on, just give him a wave and say, God's going to do everything he said he's going to do. Come on, we've been looking for the Lord for generation after generation after generation. But we very well could be the generation that's standing here one Sunday morning and we hear a shout. Then we hear a trumpet blast. And then the heavens peel back and God receives His church. Come on, we could be that very generation. They said it wouldn't happen, but I'm telling you, every word in the book, He's going to bring to pass. He's going to do everything He said. Look at somebody and say, I'm not quitting. I'm not backing down. Go look at somebody else and say, I'm sticking with it. I'm in it for the long haul. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, you're going to make it. We're going to make it. Bob, we're going to make it. Hallelujah. Jimmy, we're going to make it, man. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Leonard, we're going to make it. Brother Mac, we're going to make it. I'm going to see y'all over yonder one day. We're going to have a shouting time. Hallelujah. Somebody give him praise. Come on, everybody on your feet, give him a 
shout hallelujah. Yeah. All the persecution we've been through. People saying stuff about us, not agreeing with how we worship, not agreeing with your lifestyle. Want you to come back into the world. It calls you when you drive the streets sometimes. Let me tell you, it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth it all that you stood your ground. It's going to be worth it all that you held on to that book. It's going to be worth it all that you didn't give up your faith. Hallelujah. But you kept encouraging people. Come on. You can make it. Come on. God's going to do great things in your life. Come on. God's going to see you through this. Hallelujah. Still believing in the power of God. Believing in the miracles of God. Come on. Somebody lift your hand and just give him a praise. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. One more time. Thank you so much for joining us online, and I hope the message was a real blessing to you. You know, eternity is a real thing. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. According to the scriptures, you spend eternity in one of two places. First of all, heaven. Paul said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Or number two, in hell. Uh, Jesus talked about the rich man who went to hell and was in great torment. He was begging Abraham to send someone, a messenger, to tell his family. Well, listen, you're hearing the message today. Eternity is real, and you're going to spend it in one of two places. So why don't let's decide right now, me and you, that you're going to spend it in heaven. How do you do that? You accept Jesus into your heart. Open up your heart and say, Lord, come in. Cleanse me of all sin. I accept you as my Lord and take the throne of my life as yours. Okay, so let's pray right now. Just pray with me right where you are. Just repeat this. Father in heaven, I, I remove myself from the throne of my heart. And Jesus, I invite you to sit on the throne of my heart. Forgive me of all sin. Wash me in your precious blood. And I accept your sacrifice for me. And I thank you, Lord, for cleansing me, for saving me, and for accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Can you say amen right where you're at? Hey, thank you for joining us. And please come back. Get in. Get in the Word. Get in the flow of the Spirit. And uh, we're just blessed to have you with us and look forward to seeing you the next time.